the Hist on a very special and wonderful occasion. I have the honour to be the president, as some of you might know, of the society, and so that gives me a chance to say a few words first. So I'm going to just say a few words about the foundation of the society, the past. Uh, others will take up uh, the present and the future. So in 1717, January approximately, Michael Carney, senior fellow of the college, went to the board, he was a member, and he said we should establish a student debating society. And on the 21st of March, 1770, 13 students met in what is today the great senior common room uh, over the dining hall. And they founded the College Historical Society. There were 50 members by the end of the year, 200 by five years later, and more than 700 by 1790. And if you think of how small the college was, you realize that actually the history was something quite different than in a way that you might have expected. Many people went to the Hist debates, and uh, R.B. McDowell writes about it beautifully, how uh, the Hist in those days, and think of that, that was the time of great political ferment. The Hist was one of the places where people went to discuss the major issues of that extraordinary time. So, we can say that we are the oldest a student debating society in the world. You don't need to pay any attention to the fake news that is associated uh, with the society downstairs. It was one of my students who invented that. Uh, so I, I know the story quite well. So we are the oldest student debating society in the world. But if you look back on it, one of the things I think we can be really proud of, and I'm talking a little bit about this, let's remind ourselves. In a way, we wrote so much of the script of modern Ireland. Not only can we claim this strong connection with Burke, when uh, Carney went into the uh, board, he brought Burke's minute book because he had it. He was a friend of Burke's, he got the minute book, he showed it to the board, and he said, this is what I want established today, again. So there's a clear line back to Burke. There's a clear line back to the historical club in which Grattan and Flood were members. And then you can recite the great names. You can recite the names of Tom, of course. Not just Robert Emmett, but himself, and his two brothers. And of course, Thomas Moore was such a close friend uh, of Robert Emmett. You come forward to something that the Hist doesn't usually remember, the Catholic Association. <laughs> Strange, yes, you're absolutely, you know, we don't. We don't realize that Thomas Wise and Richard Lawler Shield, close associates of Daniel O'Connell, were members of this society. Most of you would know that the Young Irelanders essentially came out of the Hist. Not just Thomas Davis and John Blake Dillon, but at least seven or eight other members of the Hist were intimately involved right at the beginning. I'm pretty sure John Mitchell was too, well he was of course involved as such a senior figure in the Young Irelanders, but there's a question whether he was a member of the Hist and uh, that's to be looked at. And then we have the top and tail or the tail, of the Irish party. Isaac Butt, auditor of the society, founded it. Redmond, the last significant member, leader of the Irish party, was a member of the HIST. And let us not forget Edward Carson and the extraordinary qualities of that man. And how can you imagine modern Ireland without Douglas Hyde? Yeah. So we wrote so much of that script. So when it came to 1970, it's lovely to see Alan Craig here, uh, and Donald Deeney, uh, and Ross Hines, uh, so many others I think possibly here who were there in 1970 when we celebrated the bicentenary. And Edward Kennedy came and he called us, quoting somebody else, but he believed him anyway, that we are the greatest of all the schools of orators. And I think it's a reasonable enough claim. It's, a much more substantiated claim than the one which the other society persists in. <laughs> so now we are approaching 2020. The 250th session is about to come up. We're planning a great year, and you'll hear of this in a minute or two from Ursula Quill, the director of HIST 250, and the suspended program. But first of all, it's an enormous uh, pleasure here tonight for me to welcome Sir Donald Deeney. Sir Donald Deeney is, was a member of the committee of the 200th session. He was, I think, the only uh, student member of the society to speak on the main program, the Bicentenary. 
auditor of the 201st session, gold medalist. He won the Irish Times debating competition, the team prize, twice. And in the second year, he was awarded the individual prize, the only time it's ever been done. So his name appears three times in the list of Irish Times winners. Nobody else uh, appears at that. Now, the Irish Times is very special for us, of course, in the society. And isn't it wonderful that this year we won it again? And Daniel Gilligan and Roland Daly won it again. Are, 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 are they here? No, not here? Okay, nevertheless, tremendous that they won it. So we've won, of course, the Irish Times more times than any of the other societies, exactly as it should be. <laughs> now, Sir Donald is a Lord Justice of the Court of Appeal uh, in the north of Ireland. He's a member of the Privy Council. Uh, he's a pro-chancellor of the University of Dublin. Uh, an extraordinarily loyal member of the society with many other interests. For example, he was chairman of the Northern Ireland Arts Council. And uh, in that uh, capacity, he founded something which has, has had an enduring influence. That is, he, it was he who suggested that, we, that they, they establish the Ireland Chair of Poetry. So it's with uh, enormous, enormous pleasure that I invite Sir Donald uh, to launch his 250. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to address you this evening at the launch of HIST 250 and to begin by thanking David for those two kind words. Um, it's uh, almost exactly 50 years ago since I put my hand on the ballot box downstairs uh, to vote, uh, to seek to speak uh, before the vote on the admission of women to the society. And at the same moment, a romantic-looking, bearded figure, older than me, in a scholar's flowing gown, put his hand in the box. And I thought, man like that must be in favor of the admission of women, and I deferred to him. I was totally wrong. He spoke violently against the idea of admitting women to the society. And it was a warning to me, which I have borne in mind, that appearances can be misleading, and socialist republicans, because that's what he was, <laughs> can be very reactionary. <laughs> it's a reminder, of course, that until the 201st session, you had to wear a gown to speak at the ballot box uh, uh, at the debates of the society. It's, it's an honor to be here tonight and to address not only such uh, a gathering of distinguished ex-officers and ex-auditors of the society, uh, but young people currently involved uh, in the HIST who are the heirs of a, a quite astonishing and proud tradition going back to 1770 and beyond. The original charter of Trinity College Dublin from Queen Elizabeth I refers to it as mother of a university, which it proved to be. Uh, the historical club of Edmund Burke of 1747 as uh, David said, can safely be described as the father, or perhaps in 2019, at least as the non-gender specific parent <laughs> of the Historical Society of 1770. Edmund Burke remains, of course, a political philosopher of the very first importance internationally regarded and thought of as the father of modern conservatism. Would that he were alive today. <laughs> he once said of an earlier ruler in 1789 uh, that he was, quote, resolved to die in the last dyke of prevarication, unquote. <laughs> I thought that might be applied to somebody else uh, in the news at the present time. The, the pamphlets issued by the Society from time to time have emphasized, as David has mentioned, the notable leaders of nationalism associated with the society, and I think he has, has named them all. Um, but alongside that splendid tradition of courageous patriots and orators is a long tradition of distinguished scholars, such as your president, and Mahaffey, and W.E.H. Lecky, MP and historian, who sits on a stone chair in Front Square. Perhaps we might put the president there someday. 
And, uh, and writers. I, I think many here will know that Bram Stoker is a, an ex-auditor of the Hist, and will know him, of course, as the auditor of Dracula, that uh, enduring myth. But not many of you may know that he got the idea from a short story called Camilla, which was the first vampire story. And it was written by Joseph Sheridan Lefanu, who was also an ex-auditor of the society, but a, a generation before. Uh, we have had a long roll call of lawyers and politicians who took a different view from Tone and from Mitchell, and who had a major hand in running this country for centuries. Bush and Brady and Edward Sullivan and Ashburn. And one I pluck from that gathering is Thomas Langlois and Lefroy, auditor 1794 to 1795, who in his youth courted the novelist Jane Austen and nearly proposed to her, uh, but was uh, persuaded by his family not to throw himself away on this penniless chit of a girl. <laughs> but to go home and marry someone more useful to his career at the Irish bar. I think in those days that meant somebody who could keep him while they waited for the briefs to come in. He became Lord Chief Justice of, North, of Ireland and was criticized in the House of Commons for staying on when he was too old for the job. He had the unusual experience of being defended in the House by his own son, who was a member of Parliament, who pointed out that his father had voluntarily gone in the winter assizes the previous year. The son at this time was 65 <laughs> and the father 89. <laughs> These are lost days to those of us with mandatory retirement ages. And uh, David has mentioned Carson and uh, a, a very considerable figure, ultimately a law lord, member of the war cabinet as well as leader of the Irish Unionists. Uh, he was not a bad hand as a classicist, uh, but he was beaten for the Barclay Gold Medal in Greek uh, when he was an undergraduate by one Oscar Wilde. And he famously had his revenge in the long run, cross-examining Oscar with all the venom of an old friend, as someone said at the time, <laughs> in the Queensbury libel trial and led to the destruction of that great uh, writer. Uh, incidentally, as I was mentioning to some other ex-auditors here this evening, Carson is the first of quite a line of very distinguished people who were defeated for the auditorship, as he was. He was librarian. And uh, this, of course, um, uh, process of the defeated candidate being more distinguished ends. I'm not quite sure where it ends, whether it ends with the person David defeated or whether it ends with Shane Ross, who was defeated in 1970, uh, or whether it ends shortly after that time. Now this richness of different traditions and textures has been carried into our last century, into the last century with Hyde, with Connor Cruz O'Brien, Brian Lennon, Mary Harney. And it was certainly true in our time that the uh, multiplicity of traditions was very alive. To give just two examples, the defeated candidate for the auditorship in the 199th session was the chairman of the Republican Club in Trinity. And the defeated candidate for the 201st session was a white African with a double barrel name who thought the Conservative Party dangerously liberal. And I <laughs> one or two here will know who I remember who I refer to. So this openness to contrasting views is of the essence of the society and of the essence of a debate. Uh, a resolution is put forward which will often be controversial, but it is not put forward to be accepted meekly, uh, but to be expounded by its proponents and contradicted by its opponents. They are not doing so by waving placards or shouting or worse, but by advancing arguments and adducing evidence which support or undermine the proposition. The use of evidence to support propositions or undermine them is something which be, should be shared by all members of a university. Lawyers, scientists, economists, historians, but everybody who is interested in knowledge. And the very name of this society, which catches a lot of people out, of course, 
um, is a reminder that people in less liberal times sought to examine what had happened in recent or ancient history so that they could contribute and voice insights to the society uh, about them. And I look at some of the motions that were debated when David asked me to say these remarks this evening, uh, that were debated in uh, our time, in the time of some other people here. For example, that armed aggression is a justifiable instrument in foreign policy, that ethnic nationalism is evil, that this house would legalize pot. <laughs> that is now, I think, known by some other name, but the principle is the same. Uh, would abolish the Senate, sounds an old familiar one. That abortion should be legalized was passed 50 years ago in this society. That violence is necessary for an Irish solution. The last of these was in my own time as auditor, and I, I was, and I'm sure all my committee, were strongly opposed to the use of force, but it was right to debate it as tragically in 1971 some people had resorted to arms. Two prominent Republicans spoke in that debate, uh, but the motion was defeated. The society in this regard has a vital role to play. The model of our sister society, the Phil, is to invite a speaker who is listened to admiringly by the undergraduate body, and that implies a compliment being paid to the speaker and an acceptance to some degree of the validity of what they are saying. We then encounter the phenomenon widespread, not only here, but in universities uh, uh, further afield, of people objecting to and preventing unpopular speakers from coming to speak. But it is a very different matter if they are coming to debate and to support their views in debate and to be opposed by prepared speakers on the order paper and speakers from the floor. In that way, those whose unpopular views are wrong, are unjustified, can be tested or even exposed. The HIST, uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, has been at the forefront of major debates in Irish social and cultural life for the past 250 years. Uh, this celebration next year, which David and Ursula and others are organizing so ably, will give us the opportunity to reflect on our uh, long and auspicious history and its important role in promoting real debate in society. Now, more than ever in this age of uh, social media and the anonymous attack, more than ever, discourse and debate are crucial in a debating society and must be preserved and celebrated. Our proud traditions of independence and oratory have embraced all the strands of Irish modern history and addressed a wider European and indeed international audience. Long may that continue. Thank you very much, Donald. So, now to the future. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ursula Quill, who's so well known to many of you, because uh, uh, she's much closer to the society than uh, uh, the sort of dinosaurs like uh, Donald and myself. And that's a really important thing in celebrating the, uh, celebrating the, the, uh, the 250th anniversary, we must be connected to the society. So you will know that Ursula was the auditor in the 242nd session. Uh, she's an honorary member. She's done a wonderful job uh, keeping in touch with the society all these years. She's been actively involved in Parliament in Dublin, parliamentary assistant to Sean Barrett, an assistant too to Senator Ivana Bacic. She's at present uh, letting a cat out of the bag. She, I think, is the secretary of the King's Inn, Surveying Society. And uh, with, it wouldn't surprise me if next year, in our 250th year, she were the auditor of the King's Inn Debating Society. <laughs> but that's, uh, that's a, a very... Uh, the most important thing of all, of course, is that uh, Ursula gladly took on, uh, has taken on uh, the role of director of HIST 250, which is a huge, huge responsibility. And that's a responsibility which she is taking on at the same time as fulfilling so many other responsibilities. I've only mentioned, I could mention many others. Ursula has an extraordinarily uh, varied and rich life. So it's an enormous pleasure for me to invite 
uh, Ursula uh, to tell you something about our plans for HIST 250. Thank you so much, uh, Professor McConnell, uh, President of the Society, and um, thank you, Justice uh, Donald, for those Donald Dini, for those very brilliant words and for launching His 250 with such gusto. Uh, and as I look around the room at the distinguished guests, uh, Judge Owens and um, members of the, the bar and uh, Deputy Caleri, we're really just delighted that so many of you have joined us here this evening uh, for an event that we've been anticipating for a very long time. Um, but which will launch really uh, the next 12 months of uh, events in college, uh, events which will be led by the students and which all of you as honorary members and as, and as former illustrious members of the HIST uh, are very much invited to, to take a, a role in. So I, I'd just like to fill you in very briefly on, on what, what is planned. And, and first I'd like to say that we're, we're very fortunate to be, to be um, for this to be a very collaborative effort. Um, we are very fortunate to be, to be assisted in, in making HIS 250 a great success by, by the whole of college. And we're joined this evening by um, Eileen Punch and Julia Bauer from the TCD Alumni Office. Uh, and not only themselves, but we've been, we've been helped by uh, Siobhan Brady in the Alumni Office, as well as uh, Alex Fritz, who's based in the States, and Sarah McMinn in the UK. And they are connecting with our HIST alumni uh, on an international basis. And I, I just want to mention that from the outset because it has been such a, a fortunate part of our, our, our work over the last two years that we have managed to connect with our alumni uh, internationally. We're also joined this evening by uh, members of the TCD Communications Office. And of course, it will be so important to make HIST 250 a great success uh, that we get the word out and that we um, we, we get the word out across all our platforms. Um, so thanks to Cleveland Lucklin and to Tom Malloy uh, and also to uh, Ian who took photographs earlier and to Emily who's working on social media. And I mentioned our, our international HIS 250 group. We're extremely fortunate to, be, to have amongst our, our, our HIST community. Um, in London we have Eric Lowry, Hannah McCarthy, uh, who are working to, to form a UK HIS 250 committee. And in the States, very fortunate to have uh, Ted Smith, Gully Stanford, Ian Ash, David O'Sullivan, Declan Kybert, Bill Maguire, Marion Cameron, and, uh, and Frank Bannister, who goes it, it, across, across our waters. But I have mentioned all of those because, and I apologize if I've left anyone out, but just to, just to, to give you a sense of, of the amount of people who are, who are working to make this a great success, and all of them pooling their, not just their own time and resources and energy, but also their, their great experience and knowledge to make this a great success. In Dublin, we have uh, William Dunn, William Quill, and uh, Adrian Langan, um, and of course, David McConnell. And we've been, we've been working to, to put together the program, which you, I hope you all now have a, have a copy of it. Um, this is just to give you a sense of where we're going. Um, we will be adding to this program, and I hope you can, you can keep in touch with us online. But just to mention a few of the events which, which we can confirm at this stage. So we are really delighted that um, Trinity Trust has, um, has, will be financially supporting um, the first 250 year full long history of the HIST, and that will be written by uh, Dr. Patrick Gagan. Uh, so we're really delighted that that's being supported by college and uh, it'll build on the great work of uh, Ross Hines and Declan Budd and other historical works by Orby McDowell before it. Uh, but it'll act as a really important legacy item from HIS 250. Alongside that, we're working with uh, Trinity College Library, the manuscripts and archives. Uh, and I'd like to mention Ellen O'Flaherty, who's been doing great work with us in making sure that our archives are preserved and that uh, an exhibition will take place in the, uh, in the old library, in the long room, uh, in spring of next year. Along with all of that, we'll have many student events, which I think Luke will be filling you in on just, just after I, I finish speaking. Um, and they will really enthuse the entire student body in what will be a very momentous occasion for, for Trinity next year. 
But then really what I want to uh, gear all your attention on before I finish is uh, that all these events will culminate in a week of events in March of next year, the 2nd to the 6th of March next year. And of course many of you, as, as David mentioned, were around in 1970. Uh, you're lucky to, to be here for, for the 250th. Um, so we want to build on that and build on the great success of such an important program that happened in 1970 and to see what does that mean today, what does that mean in 2020 and to really tackle the big questions of our day, the future of democracy and what can we offer as a debating society and what have we offered, so what can we offer into the future. So I'm going to leave you with that and just to thank you once again for, for being here this evening. I hope you can stay on, enjoy another glass of wine, and I hope you can stay on and enjoy our honorary members' debate afterwards. So we're a meeting of Glare, August Bonnie Pan of us and I do mean to introduce um, the treasurer of the HIST. Uh, Luke Fehali, who is going to say a few words on behalf of the committee, and I'd like to thank him and the officers of the committee, including Cleveland Hamill, the record secretary who's organised tonight's, tonight's debate, and all the members of the committee who put together the reception. So, thank you, Luke, and we look forward to your <coughs> Thank you, Ursula, for that kind of introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to reiterate the welcome that you all received here this evening for our 250th anniversary celebrations. Um, firstly, I have to also convey the apologies of Catherine Kelly, who's the current auditor, and couldn't make it this evening due to illness. Um, but she sends her warmest regards to all our honorary members and would like to thank the committee for the excellent work they've put in in organising this event. Um, I'd like to say a few short words as well on what the HIST will be doing, as a, or the students of the HIST will be doing to celebrate the 250th anniversary. Um, and it's important then to realise that the context of the society, and the HIST, like as a student institution, was found in the same year, for example, that Captain Cook struck out for Australia. And is staggeringly old for most of us 21-year-olds who are running it today. Um, and over its existence so far, it has seen a tremendous amount of change. And it has undergone a tremendous amount of evolution since the 200th anniversary and indeed its foundation in 1770. Uh, not just witnessing the change that comes with two and a half centuries, but playing an active role in the growth and progress of society, whether that be through its former members, as David mentioned, like Isaac Burt and indeed Ernest Walton, who was a scientist like myself and David, um, and who revolutionised their world and disciplines. Uh, we've also hosted, obviously, important debates to further the history of society and prestigious speakers. And this illustrious history and the continuation of our proud traditions in an ever-changed society are what we celebrate tonight. The current committee and our over 10,000 ordinary members continue this tradition of bettering ourselves and bettering society in many different ways, from engaging in debating competitions both at home and abroad, where we have our arguments unceremoniously dismantled to be built up again but better, to hosting our weekly Wednesday night meetings to keep, to keep respective and productive debate alive in Trinity. But more than this, the modern HIST is a, is a close-knit community where members, no matter their identity or political orientation, can put forward ideas for logical and conscientious debate. It is the camaraderie we feel when taking the bus together on the way to support our speakers in the Irish Times final. As uh, David mentioned, Daniel Gilligan and um, Roland Daly did excellent work this year in securing the, the, uh, the win in the final. But the history is also the, the excellent far-reaching conversations we have in, in this room and the committee room. And this is how we keep the traditions of the society alive. So what we plan to do next year is to work within this community, within the Trinity community, and further afield, afield to further promote these ideals of good discourse and excellent debate. So, for example, among many other things, we plan to reinstate the historic relationships we have with our corresponding societies in Oxford, Cambridge, Durham, and the Edinburgh Spec, and engage in, broader, and in a broader effort to support, therefore, the respect for rational argument um, to maintain the honoured place for constructive discussion in our society. Um, and I'm sure we're all proud, therefore, to be able to contribute um, to the continued traditions and the continued growth for the next year, and indeed for the next 250 years, um, as we play a vital role in the support of our democracy. Thank you very much. So 
once again, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, also just to perhaps say a couple of other things. Order! Yes. Is that Mr. whatever his name is, B Camp or something down there? <laughs> the, um, one of the most important things for us, of course, is that there is a legacy. In other words, we're not just going to have a wonderful year. Of course, we'll have the history, which will be splendid. And Patrick Gagan, as many of you know, is one of our most distinguished historians. But we are also establishing uh, a speaker's fund. Uh, this will be an endowment. It will be held in the college endowment accounts. And the proceeds from that over the years will be used to promote speaking by members of the society. That's competitive debating is much, much more significant today than it was in the time of uh, many of us in the society. But today, competitive debating is so much more important. And that, of course, now extends not just to the Irish Times and occasionally to the Observer. It includes the Europeans and the worlds. And the question is, how do we, the HIST, support our speakers who get into these great competitions? And how do we allow them to travel further than we ever imagined that the HIST would travel? Well, there will be a speaker's fund. And we hope that uh, many of you will think of contributing to that. Uh, I have a great hope. And I, we're working on it as hard as we can. It's certainly not easy. Uh, but there is a great hope that the college will actually row in and redecorate significant parts of the GMB. <laughs> <laughs> and I want you to applaud that even louder because I have just written to the provost today and said to him, I'm coming to see you. I want your support in this. To me and to many of us, it is a terrible reflection. One has to be frank about this. It's an awful reflection on a college which now has 18,000 students, a society which has seven or 8,000 members, that the amount of money which the college has been spending on supporting student activities, student societies, is far less, I would say 10% of what it was in my time. There are now, I think, 150 student societies. And yet, I can say for sure that the college has spent not one single red cent on this building since it was opened in 1903. I don't mean that they haven't painted it occasionally, but there has been no serious investment in this as a building. And when we know that many distinguished speakers come to speak downstairs in the GMB, and what are they looking at? A building which is a room, which a grand room, yes, but does it live anything, does it anyway match what it should be? Not at all. Nor does this room, one of the very great rooms in college. So in any case, uh, I wrote to the provost today, and I said I have something urgent to talk to him about. And I want you to please applaud that now. And with that, please, please move around. Have a few uh, more glasses of wine, if you can possibly take the risk or whatever, or if that is in your plans. And thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.